Hello, this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 19, looking at the top 10 Return to Ravnica cards. Let's jump right in with the thing that's made people most excited, the Shock Lands. Uh, Wizards has done the right thing in reprinting these lands. These lands are extremely popular in the modern format and are essential to playing competitive magic in what is quickly becoming the newest Eternal format. I'm super happy to see these back. They make multicolor decks much easier, especially with the inclusion of cards like Farseek. Color fixing is incredible in this set, and I'm very happy to see these lands back. They haven't made the top 10 list here because they've already been printed before and everybody knows that they are amazing. Let's move on to the honorable mentions here. I've got five honorable mentions. These are all cards that I wish would have made the top ten, but are just missing something. Epic Experiment is a really fun EDH card, where you, when you have a lot of mana, you can basically cast your way into several instants and sorceries. I don't believe that it is standard or legacy or modern playable at this point, which is why it didn't make the top 10. I like the design on it. It's a, It's got that cool Genesis wave effect, but in not being able to hit creatures or lands when you use it, it does limit the scope or usefulness of it. If you wanted to make it uh, tournament playable, maybe as an instant it would be incredible. Uh, I will definitely watch it though to see what instants and sorceries come out that could possibly improve the value of this card. Also, in the current environment, it doesn't allow you to basically go um, put bonfires in the same deck because bonfire is a dead card that you would exile and not be able to cast. Uh, Rakdos Return is a card that may end up moving up into the top 10 as we figure out how fast the environment is. If the environment is extremely fast creature beat down early wins, then this card is terrible. If the environment is very slow, mid-range to late-range control decks, then this card is incredible. The ability to scale to be much better than a Blightning is great. I'm a little bit worried about how fast the environment's going to be, which is why it didn't make the top 10, but it's another card that I'm going to be watching extremely closely as we go on. Counterplex would make the top 10 a few years ago easily, but the current hate on counterspells mean that a counterspell that can't be countered uh, is not as useful as it sounds, especially since some of the best cards can't be countered, and Cavern of Souls is this card's enemy. It does help shut down the Storm deck, though, in Modern, and may even see a little bit of play in Legacy. Uh, Jace the Thought Architect, who I'm calling EDH Jace, is definitely weaker than Mind Sculptor. The minus two ability to allows you a mini intuition is pretty good. Um, the plus one ability is on the weaker side, nowhere near Fate Ceiling, and the minus eight is great in EDH, uh, but is not necessarily a game winner in the standard environment. So I think you'll see limited play in a deck or two, but will not dominate the format. Cyclonic Rift, who I've put here in the center, is one of the, is another card that I'm going to watch very closely to possibly replace Vapor Snag. I have the Overload effect is great late game to get through some extra damage. This card has a lot of potential and should be watched very closely. Put into number ten, I've cheated a little bit by putting the charms on here. The Is It Charm is incredible in itself. The ability to interact with both your control spell based decks and creature based decks and also cycle through cards late game it's great uh, the azorius charm barely made the number two spot the lifelink is going to be more valuable than people are guessing at this point because it will swing races but what i really like is putting a creature on top of your owner's library if they're attacking or blocking some of the best creatures in this environment are either tokens or they gain a lot of counters and putting it back on top of the deck in either of those cases is either basically killing it or getting rid of all of the tokens so the, or all of the counters so they have to start again. Golgari Charm may even see a little bit of main deck play but is an incredible sideboard card against those token decks and also against some of the great enchantments that are out there right now. 
Celestia Charm is a lot weaker, although it's kind of what a fast green deck needs in getting plus two, plus two on Trample and the ability to kill big creatures. Rakdos Charm is definitely sideboard only and the weakest of the charms at this point. In the number nine spot, I've got one of my favorite Wraths that they've printed, which is tough to top Terminus at this point after having recently been printed, but the blue in the casting cost is definitely relevant, especially for older formats. It's not just a disadvantage in making it a little bit tougher to cast in Standard, but in Legacy you can pitch this to a Force of Will and get some serious value out of it. The fact that it can't be countered also makes it extremely strong for Modern and Legacy, which are dominated by counter spells in several of the decks. Barash the Unseen is currently the most valuable card out of the set, although I, it is clearly being a little bit overvalued. The plus one ability is not that great. The minus seven is a great alternate win condition in a control deck, especially since there are several ways to gain huge amounts of life in this set. The minus three, though, destroy target non-land permanent, is great, especially in a control deck. The ability to remove anything, then plus one it, and destroying anything else is incredible. I'm not sure this is going to see as much play in the aggro decks because the ultimate doesn't really affect your aggro and five casting cost is a little high for a single piece of removal, although it may end up topping out the curve even in those aggro decks. Armada Worm has made it to the top of other people's lists. I've only got it at number seven here. If, if these worms had flying, the evasion would be highly relevant, but 5-5 five, five Tramplers are only just strong at this point. I also haven't gotten a chance to play with the Populate mechanic, so I don't know exactly how relevant the Populate mechanic is going to be. As long as Cyclonic Rift and Unsummon are in the environment, though, the token aspect of this card may be minimized some. Also, it looks a little tough to cast with the double white and the double green. You really have to be strongly committed to that guild. Magus Elemental is one that I'm really going out on a limb here, putting it at number six. The ability to put two counters on it for exiling an instant or sorcery could be extremely relevant. This is a potentially strong, heavy beatdown creature in Legacy and Modern. You can put this out pretty easily and defend it. It can get larger than a Tarmogoyf and do an extremely large amount of damage by turn three or turn four against combo decks. This is a great potential clock up there with Delver of Secrets and may give some extra power to the blue-red version of Delver. A Dryad Militant is in here because of its potential impact on Legacy and on Modern. It's clearly printed as some hate for Nimble Mongoose and Tarmogoyf. It also gives the Maverick deck something that it's been missing for a while, which is a solid beatdown clock in it, a one casting cost 2-1 that with a few exalted triggers ends up being three or four power beatdown will be extremely relevant. I like this design and giving you a solid body with the ability to hate on snapcaster mages. I like this a lot better than cards that don't have an impact on the board but remove graveyards. This is probably my favorite piece of hate versus snapcaster that's been printed yet. Angel of Serenity has made it to number four here. The first time that I read this card, I missed two facts. Number one, that the ability to exile creatures from game or from graveyard, that when the angel goes away, those don't come back into game. They go to the owner's hand. So this has the potential to act as a one-sided board wipe that takes a significantly large amount of mana to get back in the game. If tokens are extremely prevalent, exiling three creatures in play may matter a lot as your opponent will not get those back when the angel leaves. The other thing is that the, that the angel cannot get rid of herself, but can remove other copies. So if you already have one of these angels in the graveyard and a Cavern of Souls out, you're able to cast this, bring back the other angel, and put together a really strong endgame in a control deck. You're also able to wipe the board and get through in a mid-range deck, so this may be a really strong replacement for the Titans in being a late-game end to several decks or a control staple. Detention Sphere in other sets would definitely be at the top of the list, the Maelstrom Force like 
pulse-like ability to exile several permanents of the same name takes and improves upon the Oblivion Ring in a very positive way. The only reason this isn't at the top is because Golgari Charm is in the environment and the number one pick, which you'll see soon, is also in the environment, which limit the impact at instant speed. This is a great card. I look forward to playing it in both modern and in standard. Uh, number two here is a creature that is just incredible. This, compete, this may compete with Termagoyf for best creature out there in the two spot area. The ability to discard two cards at any point means that Burn is going to have a huge trouble getting rid of this. It combos extremely well with Gravecrawler because you can discard the Gravecrawler and then cast him out of your graveyard. It also combos extremely well with the Scavenge mechanic to make this extremely large. This is a reason that Unsummon may see some play, as the large number of counters on this can easily be reset. A detention Sphere also would, may not be able to permanently destroy this, as Green Black has Golgari Charm, but losing those counters is going to matter. I really like this creature's design. It has a nice uh, feel to it in being a zombie troll and combos very well with cards that are already out there. In the number one spot, I have what I think is the best two casting costs instant out of this set, and one of the best two casting costs instants ever. Uh, Abrupt Decays cannot, counter, cannot be countered by spells or abilities. Effect is extremely relevant in every format, including Vintage. The ability to destroy something at three casting cost or less is relevant in every format. In Legacy, this will be used a lot against blue-white control decks and also against the predominant Rug Delver and Maverick decks that are out there. In Modern, this takes out Tarmogoyce very easily and could be brought back with a Snapcaster for extra value. In the Standard environment, this takes out Detention Sphere and several of the other really good small creatures. This is an incredibly powerful spell. It's also the reason that I'm choosing Golgari or Green Black as the best of the guilds at this point. I'm going to be building around this card in Modern and in Standard. Thank you. This has been Brian Rowe with the Top 10 Return to Ravnica cards. If you have any feedback or cards that I missed, please let me know. Uh, this video is being produced before the pre-releases have started, so I'd love to hear your feedback as I'm looking forward to doing several weeks of drafts coming up and standard construction. Thanks.